Hey, what's up, family? It's your man, Daryl the Second. I hope you're doing well. Want to drop this word? Um, I prayed beforehand, but I'm going to pray again. Let's do it. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the word that you put in my heart, and I pray that those who hear it would receive it and their hearts would hear you speaking through the message, God. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just come and move on me as you see fit, and you get the glory. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Son. Now, I'm Jesus, and thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, <clears throat> I say son. He's not my son. <laughs> um, you know, there were a couple of things that came to my heart, um, and there's a song in my heart, too. But I wanted to talk about a couple different assignments. I'm, I'm listening to see if I need to go, what direction I need to go in. But there's a song Joe, um, Fred Hammond sang years ago, and I think I sang it on a recent video. But um, it's on his second, I think it's on his album called Deliverance from 1992. But he sings the song, and it goes... Um, Trusting in someone who's made of flesh and blood is such a frightful situation. Continual emotional intensive care comes from too high expectations. So like the flower depends on rainfall and like true lovers, Depend on phone calls Like the tide needs the moon My heart depends on you Woo 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 Some folks build their lives only on wealth and fame Or if they gain high place employment not knowing they're building hopes and dreams on sand, they soon lie disappointed. So like the good day depends on sunshine, and like the harvest depends on the time. Like the bride needs a groom, my heart depends on you. <clears throat> woo, 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 woo. On your holy word I am standing. For every word is true. That's why I'm trusting in you. Like a comedian needs to be funny. Pardon my voice, y'all, so tired. And like a banker depends on money. Like a song needs a tune. My heart depends on you. Woo, 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 woo. On your holy word I am standing, for every word is true. That's why I'm trusting in you. I trust you. My heart depends on thee. My heart depends on thee. My heart depends on thee, my heart, my heart depends on thee, my, just like a bent flower depends on rainfall, just like a good day depends on blue skies, you know my heart depends on you. Just like a banker depends on money, just like a song needs a tune, you know my heart depends on you. Apologies for changing keys. I'm a little, uh, sometimes I sleep with the fan on. When you ball, folks know what I'm talking about. You sweat, you're a little congested, so I'm sorry if I jump from key to key, but hopefully the tune sounded all right. I think it did. <clears throat> um, God put this in my heart, and there's a couple things. Now, as I'm singing, I see how... The two messages that came to me, they work together. Um, what I want to say is it's important to put your trust in the Lord. While he may use people to help you, ultimately our trust should go in the Lord. And I say that because people are fallible, but God is not. 
God can use somebody in a mighty way and they still can be erroneous somewhere because they're human, including myself. You know, I'm grateful to be a vessel unto God. But just like you listeners, I have to go to God and spend time in his presence because I fall short in, in my sins, too. I fall short. The Bible says all have fallen short of the glory of God. Sometimes I deal with war, uh, warring in my own flesh. I mean, you know, the Bible says um, in Romans 7, the good I want to do, I don't do. The bad I don't want to do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who would deliver me from this body of death? But then in chapter 8, it says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so just like you all are walking your walk with Jesus, so am I. And so the reason I say that is because um, if we're not careful, we can put great emphasis on a person that God uses and forget that they are the messenger. And ultimately, the focus should be on the Lord. He is our source. I may be a resource, but he is your source. Never forget that. You see that light above me. That light, if it was disconnected from the ceiling, that, that would just be a fan that had no power. But when I plug it in the ceiling and it connects to the current in this house, the current provides the light. It provides the illumination. So even though that tool is very much needed and useful, the current is where the power comes from. Now, if I just had that current in that empty hole where that fan was, that current, my spark starts some fire. So I need a vessel. It needs a vessel to go through. And God works the same way. I mean, he can demonstrate himself without people and in different ways he does. But he uses people to demonstrate himself in his glory. The Bible says in the book of Romans, gifts and callings come without repentance. And that means that you can live a lifestyle of sin and still have your gift and your calling. You may lose your anointing. You may not walk with the Lord in fellowship, but the calling and the gift is still there. Um, and it's good to have these mind, these 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 things in your mind because um, they help you because you may encounter people who are of use to the Lord in one season and may really serve God in the next season. Maybe they're backsliding or maybe they um, they're they're believers, but maybe they're missing the Lord and they try to tell you something. You have to be able to discern for yourself. And the Bible talks about I think it's in first John. It talks about testing the spirits. It's important to understand that just because a person may come to you and act as though they are speaking from the Lord, they may not always be the case. In fact, Jesus said, uh, not all who say, Lord, Lord, are mine. Sometimes there will be people who give off a outward spectacle of religion and the inward is not matching the outward. The Pharisees did this. And that's why Jesus used to rebuke them and condemn their works. And they would get upset because he was exposing them. He had authority, he had power, and he had substance because of who he was, and people felt the difference. Whereas they had knowledge, but their actions didn't line up with their, their knowledge. In fact, Jesus told his disciples, listen to what they say, but don't follow what they do. Their example was bad. And in the book of Timothy, it says in the last days, it says people will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the power inside that could actually make them godly. And so obedience really is the key in your walk as a believer, because when you walk with God, Regardless of what position you're in, whether it be a pastor, evangelist, teacher, preacher, or maybe you're not even in the pulpit, and that's okay. That doesn't disqualify you from being used by the Lord. Not at all. There is a significance he has created in your life, and you are meaningful, and you are purposeful, and you are not a waste. He has created you for something. And what my encouragement to you today would be, seek God. It doesn't mean that you don't listen to anybody. Now, don't do that, because the word of God is very clear. God created church for a reason. Community. He created us to to bond and connect with each other. But <clears throat> it's important for everything to be utilized in its proper fashion, the way he intended. You know, The Rock in WWF used to say, know your role and shut your mouth. And I'm not saying shut your mouth, but know your role. Know where God has called you to be and understand that we need each other. You know, um, I know I, I got carried away. I haven't lost an example in my mind. It'll come back. Lord, I pray you bring it back. But um, I just want to say that because if you're not careful, you can get in the mindset of thinking, well, I hear God. I don't need anybody. That's not true. What happens is you isolate. And while there are seasons where God may have you kind of isolate from folks because it's just you and him, that does happen. Um, I can speak to that. He doesn't want you to be completely alienated from community, from the church. And I, I say that because I think in America, we have defined church one way. But if you look at church, it's the body of Christ, you assembling with other believers. So you may assemble with other believers and it may not be at a building, maybe in a park, however God leads you. But I'm saying you need to be in the fellowship of other believers. It's quite important. But even in that, in doing that, you need to spend time with God for yourself. Because if you only listen to those amongst you, but you don't listen to him, you can be led astray. And I say that because there can be times in even assembling with other believers. Let's say you're in a fellowship of other believers and people aren't spending time 
in their word. You may hear something that's erroneous, but because you spend time with God, you may have something to contribute to that situation that can bring a sense of clarity. I hope that helps. And I say that from experience. I've had the pleasure of being in some groups where sometimes a person may bring something and it's very interesting, but it contradicts what the word says or in the presence of the spirit of God moving, it's not accurate. But because you spend time in the presence of God and because you have God's spirit, God can bring things to bring correction to that. I remember I had a meeting at some point with some people and um, a young lady had shared some things that were personal to her and dear, near and dear, but they kind of conflicted with um, something scripture said. And one thing that came to my heart, and I was going to share this word, it came to my spirit. And I said to her, the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And I said to her, you know, if you notice more than one person has spoken in relation to what you're talking about, but they've used scripture to dispute what you're saying, perhaps God is telling you something. And, and again, Meetings like that aren't meant for you to have clashes, even though the word says iron sharpens iron is man, sh man sharpens man is iron sharpens iron. But what I'm saying is never, ever, ever underestimate that time in the church. And, and I'm going in a different direction. I didn't even know I was going to go there. Um, just the Lord wanted. But what I want to emphasize is putting your trust in God. That's why I sang that song. Trusting in someone who is made of flesh and blood is such a frightful situation. Continual, emotional, intensive take care comes from too high expectations. And what can happen is we can put people on a pedestal and create an idol. And God doesn't want that. So I was really coming to the story of Jonah because um, with Jonah, we see a flawed individual who had resentment and unforgiveness in his heart towards a group of people. Um, that group of people had a history of contention against his people, the Jewish people. These people were the, in, the Ninevites, also known as the Assyrians. And God wanted him to give them a warning of, of judgment that was coming. He didn't want to do that because he wanted them to be judged. But God, as a result, punished Jonah. And see, Jonah ran from his assignment. And when Jonah ran, he became contained in the belly of a great fish. And the Bible talks about how he went to the moors of the earth. I mean, of, of the sea. I think it even talks about he went to the roots of the mountains. But it also talks about him going to Sheol, which is the place of the dead. So it's safe to say Jonah might have died for a short time. Um, but then he got right and he repented and he turned back to God and he fulfilled his assignment. What I brought this message to you for is this. Is there something you're running from? Is there something God has called you to do? Is there an assignment that he has placed in your life that you are fully aware of, but you've been running from it? If that's the case, my next question would be, how has your life been while you've been on the run? Has it been miserable? Have you felt a sense of purposelessness? Have you felt shame? Have you felt as though life has not gone in the direction you would have desired because deep down you know you were supposed to do something else, but you're not doing it. Why do I ask this? Well, it's really important because um, the world is passing away. And the things we do in this world, while they may mean something, when it comes to what God has called us to do, those things are shallow and they really pale in comparison. Imagine dying today, standing before the Lord. And he brings up a projector before you and the host of the heavenly court. And he shows you all the things that he designed you to do, that he destined for you. And they never got done. You might be saved and you might go to heaven, but think of all that disobedience, all the works, all the impact you could have made. And think of how much more significant life would have been if you just did what he said. I'm going to continue, but I got 1330. I got a minute and a half left to speak on Instagram. If you don't know Jesus, I ask you to please let him be your Lord and Savior. When you die, you will have to go to a place of heaven or hell. And if you don't know Jesus, it's not going to be heaven. It's going to be a place of hell. And it's called tor it's a tormented place. He doesn't want you to go there. John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. He wants to provide that for you, but he gives you a choice. If you reject him, you're going to go to hell. And he doesn't want that. He says, broad is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to salvation. And how few are those who find it. I pray you find it today. You know, Jesus lived a life of perfection. He was tempted to sin, but he never sinned like we sin every day. So he's the scapegoat that we need to be accepted in the sight of the Father. Placing your faith in him grants you righteousness, not your works. Placing your faith in him and having a relationship with him. Will you be scrutinized and disliked and hated as a result at times? Yes, you will. But it's worth it. So if you want to know Jesus, just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and that you were raised from the dead by the Father. Please come in my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. If you did that, your name is written in the book of life. And I recommend you get in a Bible-based church and watch God transform your life. And the Spirit of God is now in your heart. Get baptized in water so you can be born again of water and spirit. 
And then I'll also say, I'm doing this quick. I'm going to get back to the message. My new book is on Amazon. It's on called Random Thoughts of a Believer. Check it out. I think it'll really bless you. All right, that's my outro. I'm getting back to the video for us YouTubers. I'm going to go a little further. But imagine you had a life that was called to do so many great things, and you turned your back on it. How miserable will you feel? I, I'm telling you, there are so many people today that have done that. I heard Joe Lostein say this. It was very powerful. He said the most valuable place in the world is the cemetery. He said because buried there are, are dreams that were never fulfilled, books that were never written, sermons that were never preached, cures that were never made, all these things that God deposited in people and they never followed through on. Don't let that be you. There's a purpose that like he's called you to and you'll have a more fulfilling life. Imagine there's all these content stored up inside of you. That's a weight. And you never release that weight, that burden. When you walk around, it burdens you. It wears you out. It wears you out because you weren't supposed to carry it. You were supposed to release it. I heard someone say, a friend of mine named David Simons, he said a gift is simply that. It's a gift. You're supposed to give it. It's not just for you. Apostle Paul said, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. I kind of understand that. There's a heart's desire when it comes to preaching the gospel. If I didn't have that in me, you all, I wouldn't do this. I feel a surge. I feel a, a, a heart. I feel a pat. I, I feel this love. I don't know what the word is, but there's a strength. There's a there's something in me that is saying I gotta tell the truth. I gotta speak His word. I gotta do it. You guys, I I never elected to this position. I don't regret it. I'm grateful, but I never, I never put myself in. The, I never thought to do this. Throughout my life, God showed me different ways of letting me know that this was a part of my life. He confirmed it in many ways, but I never, I ran from him. There were so many other things I wanted to do. And when I ran from this, and there's other things that he still called me to do, but when I ran from this, even when I tried to do things that were close, but they weren't exactly this, I felt dissatisfaction. I like to sing, but for me, even, I like to sing wholesome things and sing about the Lord. And the reason why, singing for God, there's a passion. It's not religion and saying I can't enjoy singing some things that aren't godly. And, and I'm not trying to compromise. What I mean by that is not contradicting the Bible, not singing stuff that's nasty and filthy. But I mean, like, if I'm going to sing a Christmas song or a happy and, you know, you know, simple. If there's other things, that's okay. Wholesome stuff. But I'm saying when I thought about singing for the world, I didn't feel... I don't know. There was a difference. I felt that in my my heart. I don't know what words to describe it, but I knew that wasn't what I was supposed to do. When I wanted to be an orator, that was all right. But I knew I was still kind of steering clear of the direction of ministry and what God was calling me to do. And at one point, I just saw myself as a minister. I didn't know to what capacity. In different ways, God would tell me and even people would see it, but it had to be him really revealing it to me. And so since preaching... Does life still have problems? Yes. Do I still have challenges? Yes. But let me tell you something. If I wasn't preaching, if I wasn't preaching, I would be somewhere conflicted internally in anguish and miserable because I was called to do this. This is not for popularity. This is because this is what he's put in my heart. Does God still purge me, sanctify me, purify me, and work on me? You better believe it. I can't be up here preaching his word if I don't live it. I wouldn't be, I can't be up here talking about walking with God if I'm not walking with God. Because then, like I said earlier, I would be practicing that scripture where it says gifts and callings come without repentance. I would be operating in my gift, but I wouldn't be living a lifestyle of repentance. And I don't want to do that. And so I, 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 I look at Jonah as someone who was running from God and God had to redirect him and make it clear to him. I've called you to do this. And he Use those circumstances to really isolate Jonah and force Jonah to look. And I say force, I guess in a way, you know, because God gives us free will. But he gave Jonah a choice and Jonah refused to do what he said or he told Jonah what to do. and He wouldn't do it. And so God captured Jonah. And when Jonah surrendered, he let him go. Now, I don't I think sometimes we have a certain picture of God. I know this God, when he wants to get your attention, he will get your attention. That's what he did um, to Jonah. And so I turn this word back to you. Is there something in your life that God has called you to do that you've been running from? And if it is, why don't you just turn back and, and, and do it and repent? And, and that's a question that's between you and God. And I say that because your life will be better. Now, as you serve God, sometimes you have to let go of relationships. Some people you can't have in your life. No matter how cool you've been with them, you can't have them in your life because they're not supposed to be a part of your journey or your destiny. Um. 
I had a friend years ago, he told me this. He said a family member of his was called to the ministry. He said his family member was meant to go to theological school with some very prominent pastors of today. He said this friend, um, this friend said his family member was thinking about the decision. And at the time he was dating a young lady who said to him, if you go to this, I'm going to break up with you. He didn't want to break up with her. So he didn't go and didn't follow the calling that God had in his life. And after that, his life began to fall apart in a lot of ways. And it was clear that it was associated with not following the path that God outlined for him. Now, God gives us a free choice and life has hurdles, period. But when you're going on an uphill battle towards a direction God didn't call you to, you don't really have grace to be in that path. You may have common grace that God gives man, but you weren't purposed to be in that path. So you're going to run through some really, really rigorous trials that you weren't supposed to be facing because that's not for you. And so today I say, I say a lot as I hear myself. I say a lot. I say, put your attention on the Lord. Ask him, God, what do you want me to do? What am I running from? Because I, I promise you, if you do that, life will get better in many ways. You'll feel more at peace. You'll feel more purposeful. You'll feel a sense of strength, completeness in some areas and a sense of gratitude because there is mercy for starters that God has given you, but also purpose and you're doing what you're called to do. Perhaps you don't fully know what you're called to do. That's okay. Seek God. He is your provider. He is your creator. He is the one who will give you the wisdom to understand what he's called you to do. And he'll use people. But when you spend time in the presence of God for yourself, you're going to be able to discern his voice from the voice of other, other spirits. That's what's important. There's a scripture in the, um, I think it's in 1 John. It's one of the epistles. Not the gospel of John, but there's a 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Those are the, the letters. Where it says, <clears throat> if you want to uh, be able to determine the spirit of the Antichrist or the spirit of the spirit of God speaking to you, you ask a question. If a person is trying to speak on the spirit of God, you say to them, did Jesus come as a man? And if they can't answer that and say he did, if they say he didn't come as a man, that's not the spirit of God. That's a demonic spirit because Jesus did come as a man. I need to find that scripture. I didn't prepare. Um, another scripture says if a prophet says something to you, I think it's in the Old Testament, and it doesn't come to pass, you don't have to fear that prophet. And so some people will come thinking they're prophesying, and they're not. They, they're not speaking truth. And, but when you spend time with God for yourself, you're able to understand what it is, if it's God's spirit or if it's another spirit. And I say that because the Bible says, thy word, here it is, 1 John chapter 4. He says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When you spend time in his word, God will use that word as a lamp to show you what's going on. So 1 John 4. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. That's greater is he who is in me than he that's in the world. That's what that is. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. What I can tell you is if you have a question about something, you can simply say, God, will you show me? You can do what I just read, but you can also say, God, show me the truth. And he will expose falsehood. He will show counterfeit and he will show truth. And so I say that because sometimes we get hung up on an anointed person. Someone God may use mightily and they may have the presence of God in their life, but they may be in error. The character may be questioned at certain points and they may need to repent. They may have been backslidden. You pray for them. But at the same time, if you are spending so much time putting your attention on what they have to say and less on what he has to say, you have created an idol. It's kind of like a good luck charm. It's like, no, no, I use this as a, as a, as a, as a means. In fact, I'm going to use this. It's my slingshot. I bought this in the store recently because it took me back to my childhood. I used to own one. I haven't used it yet because there's a part of me that's like I need to wait because I don't want to get beside myself and overdo it and hurt something or break something. But this is a weapon. However, it's not as useful until I load something in here and let it go. And even if something's loaded in here, if I don't have my hands 
to release it and pop, it's a contraption. But when it's put in the hands of someone that knows what they're doing, bam, you see impact. When, you're, when you are a vessel and you are in the hands of the one who created you, bam, you see impact. So even though this is a great vessel, you, you know who's more great? The one who created it. The one whose hands are in. I, I guess I could say, and this is an analogy. The one who's using it because they have a purpose behind what they're doing. This is amazing by itself, but when it's put in the right hands, ooh, Nelly, it can create some damage. So I just want to and, and remind people, trust God. Trust God. Trust God. And it's okay to listen to people, but trust God. Because in the safety, in the in the multitude of count, in the multitude of people, there is there's ah, there is safety in the multitude of counsel. That's what I'm saying. But sometimes even other believers get it wrong, because sometimes we forget that we shouldn't lean on our own understanding. We don't listen to the word. We come based on our own point of view. I've I've had seasons in my life where I've taken great advice from people who are strong men and women of God, and they would speak, and God would be using them and speaking through me, speaking to me. Excuse me. But then other seasons, they would say things, and it's their own natural thinking, and they would be contradictory to what I believe God was showing me. And if I didn't listen to God and I just listened to them, I'd be all over the place. But it's because I'm putting too much emphasis on them. But you see what I'm saying? They're human. One season, they get it right. The other season, they don't. And that's why you have to spend time in the presence of God for yourself. So this message, what are you running from? And if you're running from your assignment, it's time to go back. Your life will be so much better if you do what he says. Because there will come a day we stand before God and he tests our works. You can be doing all these great things while you're alive. But are they what you're called to do? Did he call you to that? You might think I'm supposed to be a lawyer. And God says, no, I've anointed you to be a barber. I want you to cut hair and preach the gospel. I want you to make people look good. And I'm going to use you while you're there to lead people to me. And there's no shame in that. You might say, Father, I want to be a doctor. He said, no, no, I've called you to be someone who cleans the streets, a street sweeper or a garbage man. There's no shame in that. Society may view it as, as lesser than, but if God has called you to that, that's okay. That's your, 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 your grace there and your grace to do something. So be who you were called to be. Don't be ashamed. And it's not too late. Maybe you said, God, I spent all this time in this one area. How can I just stop now? He'll help you with that. Apostle Paul was on his way to hurt a lot of Christians and God interrupted his life to turn him into a Christian and use him mightily. But prior to that, he was a Benjamite who was a Pharisee, who was a religious leader, who was highly intelligent. And God used all of that to help him, to use him to further the gospel. God knows your starting point. He knows your ending point. He knows how to reach you in the middle. He is alpha and omega, which means in Greek, the beginning and the end. He knows how to reach you, where to reach you, when to reach you, because he's God and he's mighty like that. So if he's telling you to write that book, write that book. Before someone else writes it. And you're looking in sadness like, dang, that was my assignment. And if that happened, repent. Because there's another book God can write through you. I pray this word encouraged you. I pray it blessed you. And I pray it hopes it spoke to your heart. And it blessed you to realize that God has so much for you. <clears throat> um, I forget who sang this song, but it's based on uh, Romans. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. God bless y'all. I've already done the salvation prayer, but Romans 10 verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that he died and was raised from the grave, you will be saved from your sins. In fact, I can turn to Romans right now. The other scripture was 1 John 4. Let me write that down. And then Jonah as well. If you guys want to go back and read these, and I encourage you to do that so God can talk to you. Because even though I reference some things, there's more to be said and God will speak to you. And I encourage you to spend time with God for yourself. Don't just take my word for it, as we just talked about. Romans 10. I'm going to read there and we're going to close. <clears throat> uh, here we go. 
But what does it say? This is verse eight. Verse eight. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm going to keep going. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. That's us. When we preach, I'm called to preach. But it ain't just me. There's others out there too. But we're called to preach. And how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. All right, Lord Jesus, as I speak this word, I pray, God, that those who heard it would have received it, have understanding, and that more souls are brought to your kingdom. And you get the glory and honor in Jesus' name, amen. I said the salvation earlier, but we'll do it again. Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross, and I believe you were brought back from the dead by God the Father. I need a Savior, and I need you as Lord. Please come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior, and save me from the penalty of my sins. I surrender my life to you and I serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all, it's been a pleasure. It's been a blessing. And I'm grateful to be able to do this. If it wasn't in me to do, I wouldn't be up here. To God be the glory. To God be the honor. And if you get a chance, go on Amazon and check out my new book. I have two books, period. But my new book is called Random Thoughts of a Believer. I have a hard copy and paperback and Kindle. And I am working on the audio. It's scheduling, so it's taking some time. But when the audio is complete, I will let you know. I think this book will really bless you. And um, I got to get a copy of my first book, too. That's one that's for young men, but it actually blesses people, too. It's called God and His Men. And then colon, the two dots, a spiritual enrichment plan. But if you just put my name in Amazon, you'll find it. Love you. God bless. I, I do that like the Bible says, greet each other with a holy kiss. So God bless you. Peace.